Pipes and drums. Rolls. One, two. Today, the 15th of August, marks the 75th anniversary of the victory over Japan Day, VJ Day. This was the day that the Second World War finally came to an end. It's a great honour for me as President of the Royal British Legion Scotland and of Poppy Scotland to say some introductory words at the start of this online commemoration. In fact, Anything I might say would be quite inadequate compared to the words of someone who was himself there. So I'm going to quote the final lines of Field Marshal Slim's book, Defeat into Victory, about the campaign in Burma fought by the 14th Army and the Royal Air Force. His words could just as well apply to everyone else involved in the war against Japan elsewhere in the Far East including the Royal Navy and, of course, the Far East prisoners of war and the countless civilians, including women and children, who were interned under the most frightful of conditions and who somehow survived. Field Marshal Slim's words apply to them all. He wrote, Yet there's one thought that I should like to be the overall and final impression of this book, that the war in Burma was a soldier's war. There comes a moment in every battle against a stubborn enemy when the result hangs in the balance. Then the general, however skillful and far-sighted he may have been, must hand over to his soldiers and to the men in the ranks and to their regimental officers and leave them to complete what he has begun. The issue then rests with them on their courage, their hardihood, their refusal to be beaten either by the cruel hazards of nature or by the fierce strength of their human enemy. That moment came early and often in the fighting in Burma. Sometimes it came when tired, sick men felt alone, when it would have been so easy for them to give up, when only will, discipline, and faith could steal them to carry on. To the soldiers of many races who in the comradeship of the 14th Army did go on, and to the airmen who flew with them and fought over them, belongs the true glory of achievement. It was they who turned defeat into victory. Eighty years on, we're proud to echo Field Marshal Slim's heartfelt words. We honor them all on the sea, on the land, and in the air. In 2020, we all continue to face so many challenges, whether or not they're related to COVID-19. Later, we will hear the words of the famous Kohima epitaph, for your tomorrow we gave our today, being recited by a survivor of the Japanese internment camps. As we reflect on those words, 
Let us hope that today and in the future, we will all be able to look those challenges in the eye, not with the bitterness, rancor and anger that seems too often to darken our lives these days, but together with confidence and good heartedness. Let us hope we can look to the future in that same spirit of comradeship that inspired the 14th Army and all those others to see it through so bravely and successfully to the end. We salute them all. On behalf of Royal British Legion Scotland and Poppy Scotland, welcome to the VGA Day Service of Remembrance. On the 15th of August 1945, Japan surrendered unconditionally to the Allies and the Second World War came to an end. Scotland had been at war for 2,173 days when the Japanese Emperor made his first ever radio broadcast and announced the unconditional surrender. The aftermath unveiled the great suffering which men, women and children who had been in the Far East uh, underwent. The world also became aware of the power of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So join us as we hear the stories of those who fought, served and were prisoners of war in the Far East. I was a wireless operator and we were transferred, you know, individually. So if you needed a wireless operator somewhere, you were just sent there. I was um, able, able seaman. Well, able seaman looks after the ship and then anything to be happening, why not? To war, 18. And I was, uh, I actually wanted to join the Navy to be the truth. But I ended up in the Air Force and I was sent to London and through selection boards and what have you, I was selected to train as a pilot. Well, I was not actually born in Changi Prison because my mother was allowed out for a couple of weeks for her birth. But um, I spent my first three years in internment the first two in Changi prison and then one and a half or so in Syme Road camp. My name is Robert John Ransom, known as Jack, Jack Ransom. I served with the 118 Field Regiment Royal Artillery. This is where I thought, oh, communication between Europe and, you know, places like Arabia, Right to Burma. I'd be 20 when I joined up, uh, and uh, I was uh, I celebrated my 21st uh, birthday in China. I was in China for nearly two years. Well, I wanted to go, I wanted to go into the RAF, and I wanted to be a wireless operator. So I, I joined the, the the cadets, the Royal Air Force cadets to make sure that when my papers came that I would be a member of the Royal Air Force. That was it. I was in a most in the war. Did you enjoy your time during the war? I uh, had been ups and downs right enough. But I finished up in Australia. And, but unfortunately, the time I'd finished my training and there was over 200 of us, all called together and told, I'm sorry to tell you, but we have no need for you. I was regraded and I became a codes. Have you heard of codes and ciphers? Well, I became a codes and ciphers person. I did my training, and I can't tell you much about that. But uh, I did my training, got through it all, uh, became a sergeant 
and uh, sent out to Burma. Later, I, I have a few memories of one memory of Changi, which is basically a very high wall, which wasn't scary or, or anything, it just had always been there, but I can remember standing and looking up at it. Um, and then we were moved to Syme Road, which was a much pleasanter area. It was an old RAF camp, and uh, we were there for the last year and a bit. I was born in Peckham, London, so I'm a Cockney, a Dell boy. And I joined the Territorial Army at the beginning of 1939. So when war was declared on the first Monday in September 1939, I was already in uniform. said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let us pray. Loving creator of all that is and was and will be, let us give thanks for peacemakers who reach out to those who wish them harm. Let us pray for the people who made peace in 1945. Let us give thanks for the people we cherish who bring colour and vibrancy into our lives. Let us pray for the personnel whose bravery and courage was sore tested by their service in the Far East. Let us give thanks for life in all its fullness and freedom. Let us pray for the men, women and children whose lives were violently extinguished in the Far East. Let us give thanks for the men and women of today's Navy, Army and Air Force. Let us pray for those who still face danger and put their lives at risk so that others might live in safety. Surround us with your love and keeping this day and every day when we feel like our lives burdened. In the name of Jesus Christ, who overcame death and walked in the garden on that day of Easter to remind us that we will never be alone. Amen. Can you remember VJ Day when it happened back in 1940? Very much so, very much. It started, of course, with, with VE Day first, 
and then two months later on VJDs. So we, we were waiting for it, actually. Lady, Lady Mountbatten said to us, my husband, I remember saying this to my husband says that it won't be long now. And the next week the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima. Where were you? Where was I? In Kun, in a place called Kunming in southern China. The year was 1944, and uh, I landed at Bombay, only there two or three weeks, and <laughs> the foot on the train for Calcutta. And do you know how long it took me to get to Calcutta on the train? 72 hours. Got to Calcutta, there for two or three weeks, off to a place called Tullyhall which is the air base, the RAF, for Imphal. But I didn't see any of the fighting there. Well, I was on five troop ships, uh, and we changed eventually from in, in Aden, 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 and uh, then we put on a boat and shipped to, so-called, to Singapore. But, un but fortunately, the, the Japanese beat us to it. And the boat just turned around and headed by what we thought it might be home, but in actual fact it was uh, ended up in uh, Karachi. We came from for, for Australia to Japan, and the, there was not just our boat, there was other boats as well, all came in together more or less. And I'm thinking that that was a finish of Japan. I don't think we were. We were taken out and never went back again. So I would take it to be it was a finish here, you know. Yes, I think meeting meeting personalities. Because because we were in China behind behind the, the, the lines, uh, we were un, unusual. And there was only fifteen of us on our unit. And uh, we met many of the high hedrons. Lady Lady Mountbatten used to stay with us often when she and her husband flew in to see Chiang Kai-shek, she would just stay with us and he would carry on to, to Chongqing to interview Chiang Kai-shek. She would stay with us. She was a charming lady, got on fine with her. So that was that. Well, they came, they started on the northeast coast of Malaya. They landed there and fought their way down the peninsula, some of them on bicycles. And um, they just came right down and there weren't enough planes, there weren't enough soldiers in that part of the country. They just came straight down the peninsula, across the causeway from Johor into Singapore. And because they had control of the water supply, which was in Johor Bahru, on the other side of the strait, the um, people in charge in Singapore just had to surrender because if they didn't, the water would be cut off. We were ordered to surrender. On Singapore Island. On Singapore Island. The reason given to us for surrender was the trouble that the civilian population were in with lack of water and the Singapore town itself was being bombed day and night. Uh, so, we didn't, we didn't understand why we were surrendering, really. But it was an order. And eventually, of course, the Japanese moved in. But before they moved in, we did as much damage to our equipment as we possibly could. We had artillery guns, 25 pounders. So we destroyed the breech blocks by throwing them down a well and various other activities to make sure we didn't pass on any vital pieces of equipment. They were interned for about three and a half years. My father was not with us because he was a volunteer and he was sent to work on one of the islands off Singapore. Um, and later he was sent up to Burma to work on the railway there. I never saw the Japanese until I was taken prisoner. She always said it was really good to have me. I sort of kept her, um, she gave, gave her something to do, I suppose, and um, 
someone to care for. Our job, was, as I said, was a mobile transport wing. And there was part of what, you may not have heard of it, but Combat Cargo Task Force. And we supplied the troops with whatever they required. And they told us by radio, and they wrote it down and deciphered it and passed it on to the powers that be. And they supplied them with what required ammunition or, or well, uh, casualties that had to be flown out and all that. So I considered it a very important job. Well, we were just uh, more like laborers, see, loading guns and God knows what not. But all in all, it was no bad, it was quite good. The prisoner of war in Changi went up to the railway in Thailand, in groups. And we went, I went up in the final group. And by that time, hundreds of prisoners of war who had gone up previously had died from cholera and various other diseases. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. And the going down of the sun, and in the morning. We will remember them.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colours in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. It is such a privilege to be able to share some of my father's story with you as we stand underneath the iconic Fourth Rail Bridge, a very special place for my father where he often walked as a young man. My father joined the army at 19 and was captured at the fall of Singapore in 1942. 
He was sent to work on the infamous death railway in Thailand where hundreds of thousands of men died. He was horrifically tortured with five other men for concealing a radio in the camp. Only two men survived the torture and my father was one of them. When he came home in 1945, he never spoke about what had happened to him for 50 years. He was so eaten up with revenge for a man called Nagasi, who was the Japanese interpreter present whilst he was being tortured, that it almost paralysed him. This silence nearly destroyed our family. He discovered after many years that Nagasi was still alive and was seeking his forgiveness. So my stepmother started to correspond with Mr Nagasi. When we got, when I got up there to the start of the railway in Thailand at Kanchanaburi, they needed people to work on the railway near the Burma border. So we were then ordered to walk or to march from Kanchanaburi at the start of the railway up to the Burma border at a place called the Three Pagodas, about 200 miles. Well, some of us got there, some of us didn't. Eventually, I got to this small camp on the Burma border. There were some Australians in it. And with the Australians, we were put to work building the railway embankment, the embankment on which the railway was to run. I'm going to read to you today from my father's book entitled The Railway Man by Eric Lomax. Dear Mr Nagasi, I've just finished reading your book, Crosses and Tigers. This is of particular interest to me because my husband is the Royal Signals officer who had been arrested along with six others in connection with the operation of a radio in the railway workshop camp near Kanchanaburi in August 43. My husband also had with him a map of the railway. He is the man you describe on page 15 of your book being tortured so terribly. His mother did die at home in Edinburgh one month after the fall of Singapore. A relative has told me that she died of a broken heart. My husband already knew who you were, having recognised you from the article which appeared in the Japan Times of 15th of August 1989. He is most interested in having contact with you, for he has lived with many unanswered questions all these years, questions to which perhaps only you can help him to find the answers. Maybe you also have questions about the Kanchanaburi radio affair. If you're willing, perhaps you would agree to correspond with my husband. My husband has lived all these years with the after effects of the cruel experiences he suffered and I hope that contact between you could be a healing experience for both of you. How can you feel forgiven, Mr Nagasi, if this particular former Far East prisoner of war has not yet forgiven you? My husband does understand the cultural pressures you were under during the war, but whether he can totally forgive your own involvement remains to be seen. And it is not for me, who was not there, to judge. Yours sincerely, Mrs Patricia M Lomax. On the 6th of November, when Patty went downstairs to collect the mail, she, which was lying on the floor, just inside the door, she saw an express airmail letter from Japan. It was addressed to her, but she brought it to me unopened. I sat in my pyjamas on the edge of our bed and opened the tissue-thin envelope. Dear Mrs. Patricia M. Lomax, I'm now quite at a loss after reading your unexpected letter, and I'm thinking that it is very natural indeed for me to expect such this letter. The words you wrote to me, if this particular former Far East prisoner of war has not yet forgiven you, has beaten me down wholly, reminding me of my dirty old days. I think having received such a letter from you is my destiny. Please give me some time to think it over and over again. But please tell your husband that if I'm a bit useful for him to answer any questions that he has had in his mind, I'm willing to answer them. Anyhow, I'm beginning to think that I should see him again. Looking at the picture, he looks healthy and tender, gentlemen, though I'm not able to see the inside of his mind. Please tell him to live long until I can see him. Most sincerely yours, Nagase Takashi. P.S. Please let me know your telephone number. P.S. 2. Excuse that my mind has confused after reading your letter and I could only write what you read here. 
I will try to find out the way I can meet him if he agrees to see me. And thank you very much for your taking care of him until today for a long time. The dagger of your letter thrusted me into my heart to the bottom. Patty thought that this was an extraordinarily beautiful letter. Anger drained away. In its place came a welling of compassion for both Nagasi and for me, coupled with a deep sense of sadness and regret. In that moment, I lost whatever hard armor I had wrapped around me and began to think the unthinkable that I could meet Nagasi face to face in simple goodwill. Forgiveness became more than an abstract idea. It was now a real possibility. I remember very clearly uh, just before we were released, um, everybody, we were in a long hut with perhaps 10 beds down each side of the hut, uh, camp beds. And um, we heard this rumble in the distance. We were all very hungry and all the women looked very depressed and sad and down. And this rumble got closer. I didn't know what it was, but everybody else got up and walked out of the hut. So I did too. And overhead, quite low, there came a plane. And it had RAF symbols on the wings. I didn't know what it was then, um, but everyone around me was saying, thank God, thank God. And as they flew over us, the, the sort of hatch opened on the bottom of the plane and thousands of pieces of paper fell out and fluttered down and uh, everyone was picking them up and saying, thank God, thank God, thank God. And these little flyers said, the war is over. Japan has surrendered. I'll tell you something about that, which is not top secret. I deciphered the signal, which said that the atom bombs had been dropped and the um, consequences of that. Do you know this, what I feel about that? A lot of people are controversial about the atom bombs. But that's the best thing that happened because it saved thousands and thousands of lives, not just ours, but Japanese as well. So it stopped the slaughter and then things gradually wound down. We didn't know about it. We knew nothing about VE Day in England. We didn't get that. Rumours, of course, you get rumours when you're a prisoner of war, but you don't believe them. So BE Day, we didn't know nothing about. We didn't know about successes. But we thought, we thought that things might be going out that way. We thought that was the end of the war there. We realised that was the end of the war and great joy. No, we didn't realise at the time about the atom bombs that had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and um, we, we learned about that later, much later in my case. I was working on the defence tunnels in Singapore. The Japs sent guards, the Japanese guards, came for us every morning at daybreak. You work from daybreak to, day, to, dawn, to night time, all day. day. Seven days a week. One day we got off, it was the Emperor's birthday. That one day in the year. Worked all that time on the defence tunnels. Paraded every morning at sunrise to be collected by the Japanese guards. And then on this morning, towards the end of 1945, must have been August, they didn't turn up. Why? Went back to our billets in, in Singapore Ch jail, Changi jail. Came again, it turned out next morning. Again, it didn't turn up. Then the rumors came. Somebody said the Japanese were about to surrender. We didn't believe it. But eventually, of course, it came true because the Japanese didn't turn up again. 
first real signs was a paratrooper walking up the road towards the jail. What did he say to you? I said, good morning. <laughs> and what did he say to you? He just looked at me. I was a scarecrow. I was dressed in rags. Oh, I did anything on. No shoes. I only weighed six stone. We all weighed. That was our weight, six stone. We were, we, we hadn't, we were fed on one bowl of rice a day. What did that mean to you to see that American paratrooper? Well, I don't know what, 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 whether it was American or British. I was just pleased to see somebody. The fifth, I always look upon the 15th of August as the day. And I always consider that as the day. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, well, well you, you met people and you lost people who lost you. Lost their best pals and things like that. Uh, I, there's none of them left that I know of. But we didn't have many. I suppose you could say my wife was one of them, because we got married well. The staff to VG Day. Some soldiers came with with trucks after a while, and these trucks had like seats around the back, and the soldiers helped us onto the trucks, and they drove us to Raffles Hotel. But it wasn't a luxury hotel at that point in time. It was more of a transit camp. And five or six camp beds in every room. And we, it was women only. It was only the people from our camp that went. And um, I remember sitting in a small garden and just enjoying the grass and the flowers and, and the things that were growing in the garden and playing there. Holding on to revenge and hatred for someone else only destroys the person who generates it, and we witnessed that as a family. It is astonishing that with help, my father managed to get to a place where he could forgive Mr. Nagasi and be released from the terrible pain he experienced. The Japanese found better rations for us. They were still in charge, the Japanese. They found some other rations of clothes, mainly coloured T-shirts. And eventually, Lady Mountbatten arrived up and we saw her. And eventually, after Mountbatten had signed, which I got a copy of, of the surrender of the Japanese, then he came up to the Ch Changi jail. And we thought, well, he's in charge of everything. He's Mountbatten. He's the old Mountbatten commander in South East Asia. So we turned out a guard of honour, a prisoner of war. It must have been the most nondescript guard of honour he has ever seen. No two were dressed alike. Some had shoes, some didn't. We had clogs made out of wood. And he walked down that three rows of guard of honour. There were three rows Three rows of Dutch prisoners of war, Dutch army prisoners of war, three rows of British prisoners of war, and three rows of Australian prisoners of war. Three rows of 10 in each. That was 30 Aussies, 30 British, 30 Dutch. Nine, a guard of honor of 90 people. All nondescript. No two looked alike. Some had footwear, some didn't. Some of us were only weighing six stone, and he walked down that guard of honour as if he was at Buckingham Palace. And all I got when he stopped in front of me was a white uniform gleaming with medals and brass and buttons. The war in the Far East is often referred to as the Forgotten War, but let us not forget. Let us remember the service personnel who fought and endured in the most unbelievable circumstances. Let us remember the prisoners of war whose captivity was very difficult. And those who survived spent a lifetime living in the trauma of their experiences. Let us remember 
the exceptional circumstances afterwards as a result of the atomic bombs being dropped. And as individuals and communities and nations, let us commit ourselves always to work for peace and hope and justice. Let us be a light shining in the darkness and always work to make the world a better place. So let us remember. Shortly, we're going to see a real life clip of my father meeting Mr. Nagasi in later life in Thailand where this act of forgiveness took place. Forgiveness is the greatest gift that we can give to another human being. It is also at the heart of the Christian gospel and the greatest gift we can receive from God. Sometime, the hating has to stop. May I touch your hand? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, no, I mean, when you are tortured, you know, oh. being tortured, I measured your part. Yes. And uh, yes. you are part of it is very smooth, yes. so I am very well, much relaxed. You see, these are, the, these are where the broken bones are. Mm. Yes. yes, I remember. Yes. Mm. Very sorry. Mm. Very sorry for you. Well, we've, uh, we both survived. As a member of the Japanese army, we treated your countrymen very, very badly and against the humanity. Uh, yes. I realized that. Yes. So when I repatriated from uh, here to country, yeah. And uh, I got uh, various uh, sufferings yeah. in my yeah. heart and mind. Yeah. But I tried. And whenever I think of you, yeah. why you are born in this world? <laughs> what purpose? Yes. For what purpose it's you are born? It's a difficult question mm. to answer. Yes. I'm very, very sorry. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I think I can die safely. What was it like getting home? Oh, very nice. Lovely, lovely. You hadn't, hadn't seen my folk for nearly four years. And they hadn't seen me, of course. <laughs> I, I was offered, when you were being demobbed, they said, would you like to continue in that kind of work? And they said, what does that mean? Well, you could go to Washington or someplace else. And I thought to myself, hey, someplace else? So I said, no, thank you. I, 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 all, I've been away from the, the house for four years, over four years, in Portobello. And uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going back. So I went back to Portobello. Have you had a good life, Edwin? Yes. I had my ups and downs right enough. But um, it's not bad. Can't complain. When I came back, I married the girl that I got engaged to during the war. A Scottish girl. Came from peoples in the borders. I lost Helen, unfortunately. Uh, Helen in 1974. She was aged 57. She hadn't been very well. So I lost Helen. I remarried a second time to Joyce, who also had been in the, in the uh, RAF. Helen had been in the RAF. Joyce had been in the RAF. So I married Joyce, and Joyce died in 08. Came up to Largs. I married Mary from Argyle. So I've been married three times. I've had an excellent life. Uh, I've known my, I knew my wife from 10 years of age at school. And uh, after the war and that, we eventually got together because she was very keen on dancing. And she was a lovely dancer. But she died. Just over a year ago. Uh, well, 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 my wife and I were trying to remember because she was in the war. We became more friends, if you like, at, uh, in Dundee. Got married in uh, 60. Oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> you should know that. 
Married in 51. Married in 51, two children. Nancy, who's her name? Uh -huh. Who were married in uh, 1951. Jill came along in 1953. Got that right, too. Kenneth, I've got, I've got a son, yes. I've got a son who came to, two years after Jill, called Kenneth. Had a very good family. Both, both her own family and both my in-laws do. Tremendous. Can't complain. Go in peace. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields, the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>